take their seats. I just want to see by a show of hands, who's here from the Boston area? Okay. <laughs> just wanted to do a check because uh, the mapping project is a very Boston-centric incident and um, wanted to get a sense of who is sort of already grounded in it. But for the rest of you, it's coming to a theater near you. Yeah. It is. So uh, thank you so much for coming to this session. I'm Peggy Shuker, ADL New England's Interim Regional Director. We are intending to make this program and this panel as interactive as possible. I urge you to think of questions, write them down, and uh, pass them in, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. I'm going to start with some brief introductions of our panelists before I then set the stage for our conversation today. So to my left is Justin Finkelstein, who is my ADL colleague. Justin provides analysis and insight on a range of issues, including the many manifestations of anti-Semitism in public discourse, elections, political movements, and on campus. Justin's work in, with respect to the mapping project in identifying the anti-Semitic tropes and themes baked into that project was a really critical piece in our ability to communicate to our elected officials and others about the need to call this out for what it was. Um, to Justin's left is Jeremy Burton, the executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Boston. Uh, Jeremy is known as a highly valued thought partner and leader in the Boston community and beyond. For us at ADL, Jeremy's not only a thought leader and a thought partner, but an action leader and an action partner. We at ADL New England partner with JCRC um, on a variety of issues of concern to the community, and that partnership is, is one great example of how the sum is greater than the parts. Boston, as you know, is the test kitchen of all too much anti-Israel and anti-Semitic rhetoric and events. Uh, speaking on behalf of ADL New England, we couldn't respond as deeply and completely against anything from BDS resolutions in city councils in, in terms of advocating for genocide education and, of course, the mapping project without our strong partner and Jeremy's leadership. To Jeremy's left is Julie Hammerman, who's the executive director of JLens, the investor network that explores a Jewish lens on investing, which as you heard uh, just in the past hour was acquired by ADL. Founded in 2012, JLens represents the Jewish community in two influential global movements, socially responsible investing and corporate social responsibility. In 2015, with seed investments from Jewish institutions, Jay Lenz launched the $50 million Jewish advocacy strategy to invest in 300 of the most powerful companies in the U.S. to advocate as shareholders on Jewish communal concerns, religious tolerance, Jewish social and environmental issues, and support for Israel. So with that as a brief introduction, I'm going to uh, now turn to uh, Now turn to uh, setting the stage and framing the conversation for today. So our panelists today are going to be connecting a lot of dots to explore two related trends impacting the way our community engages in public discourse on issues of concern to the Jewish community. One is the increasingly common tactic of isolating and excluding Israel and the Jewish community from full participation in the public square and how communities can respond. We'll use the mapping project as one illustration that also touch on a number of others. The second is the use of the tool of advocacy in the corporate sphere through ESG and shareholder activism to promote ethical corporate decision making and to incorporate values and ethics in the investment process. It's a tool that is uh, important to highlight because it's a tool that's not just a way to react to a situation like the mapping project, but it's a way to be proactive, um, as Julie is going to, to highlight. 
Um, unfortunately, the ESG's field of overall good intentions has not made it immune from anti-Israel and anti-Jewish discrimination. Julie and Jay Lenz work towards the removal of the anti-Israel and anti-Jewish bias in ESG while ensuring the Jewish community has a meaningful role in this important and influential movement. So to set the stage today, I'm gonna set out a few exhibits. So exhibit number one is the Boston Mapping Project. Just six months ago, an anonymous group unveiled a website called the Mapping Project. The Mapping Project's an interactive map that pinpoints the locations of Jewish communal and other community organizations in Massachusetts, including ADL, which was really at ground zero of the Mapping Project, that were deemed responsible for the colonization of Palestine and other perceived harms, in quotes, that we see linked, such as policing, U.S. imperialism, and displacement. They also labeled Zionism as a harm. In many cases, the mapping project was so traumatic, really, for the community because it named individuals, names, addresses, including the board members of many Jewish organizations and donors. They were republished um, on that organization's uh, websites and uh, you know the naming and shaming of the Jewish community left left a lot of fear and, and intimidation in the community as a result so exhibit number two Tufts University last spring we saw a pledge that student groups not associate with or interact with other student groups on campus that recognize Israel as a Jewish state we'll talk more about the specifics of this which came to be somewhat of a litmus test um, as our conversation continues. Exhibit number three, Twitter. Twitter has been one of the primary places for disseminating the hate that is in the Boston Mapping Project. Last week, ADL joined dozens of other groups to ask advertisers to pause Twitter spending because of our profound concern about anti-Semitism and hate on that platform. And number four, um, is the removal of Morningstar from the J Lens Do Not Invest list following a two year campaign led by Julie and J Lens and the sp specific and significant changes Morningstar has agreed to make to eliminate support for BDS from their ESG services. So that's a lot of needle threading, but I'm going to turn to Julie right now just to um, help us understand and ground us in ESG. Um, and the important work Jay Lenz is doing, and then we'll jump into the mapping project. Great, can everyone hear me? Okay. Hi everyone, so this is a really exciting uh, moment for, for me and my team at Jay Lenz. You probably heard that Jay Lenz is now part of the ADL family. I feel like we should have gotten team, we talked about team ADL sweatshirts or uh, some sort of merch, but um, we're so excited to be in this room at this convening, and thank you so much for having us, uh, Peggy, on this session. Um, so I just for a second want to, um, because I have a room full of ADL supporters and staff, to say this is a very full circle moment for me. My first introduction to Jewish communal leadership was in the Young Leadership Program at the New England ADL, um, where I learned about anti-Semitism and various manifestations, and that program obviously is supported by many of you, um, and then started to find some of that in my professional field. So the area that I work in is called values-based, it actually has many, many names, many acronyms, just like the Jewish community, many acronyms, many terms, um, but it started as SRI, or socially responsible investing, and then it was values-based investing, and mission-aligned investing, and program-related investing. Um, and the latest acronym, which is probably one of my least favorite, is ESG, which seems to have taken hold. Um, but, but essentially, the core of ESG is values-based investing this uh, movement that ethics and values belong in the investment process. And this is something that, of course, obviously resonates deeply in Jewish teachings and text as well. So it's an incredible space for the Jewish community to show up. Unfortunately, we really weren't in this movement um, for a variety of reasons. And so Jalen's was a project that I started 10 years ago to be a bridge, to bring the Jewish community into this space that we'll talk about. It's an enormous advocacy arena. 
Obviously, institutional investors and corporations yield tremendous power, and so it's an important space for us to be in as a community. Um, so Jalen's runs um, the Jewish Advocacy Strategy. It's an investment strategy. It invests in 300 companies. It scores companies on a range of Jewish values, one of which is coexistence and anti-Semitism and hate speech. Another is support for Israel. We also focus on environmental issues and social issues and other ethical considerations. Um, but that allows us to build relationships with other institutional investors, other faith communities who lead this field, um, and of course with corporations who we are advocating with on a regular basis. Thanks, Julie. Um, I'm gonna turn to you, Jeremy, just to kind of take us through the drama of finding out about the mapping project and uh, how, how the Jewish community really got together to respond. Thanks, and thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I'm the only one on this panel who's not literally on Team ADL, but I feel very much like in Boston we are a team of ADL and JCRC and our partnership in the community, which I'll talk about. I also have to say, and Julie sort of like inspired this, it's a coming home for me too because the first time I spoke at an ADL conference was in 1991, uh, which when I was a student on a college campus in New York City dealing with really vociferous anti-Semitism, it was the ADL regional office that reached out and provided like security training to my family and to Jewish students on our campus to support us in what we were dealing with. So it's really quite coming around to a place that I've always felt at home and a real partner and support in my life and my journey. So the mapping project. Not atypical of how these things happen. A group of people dropped something without any prior notice just as we were headed into Shabbat. It's actually not the first time that this has happened in Boston where vociferous left-wing anti-Israel groups post something just at the moment that they know that several of our most visible leaders in our community are stepping offline. In this particular case, it was also before Shavuot, uh, which is for some of us, including myself, a three-day uh, weekend when it's combined with Shabbat. So there we were on Monday night, in my case, coming back from this three-day holiday. Uh, we have a great partnership with ADL, uh, and the regional director, uh, Robert Treston, who's moving on to another role within ADL, like is one of the few people who can actually cut through my do not disturb Shabbat on my watch and like with his, you know, it's set up that way. And so like, I was kind of aware that something was coming because there was like, as soon as Shabbat is over, we got to talk, uh, <laughs> kind of dynamic to it. But essentially on Monday night, you know, jumping back in and it's us and ADL and we're part of something in partnership with our Jewish Federation called Jewish Emergency Management System. And so there we are on Monday night with this, this happened. Many members of the Jewish community had already been reaching out to ADL on Sunday, on Monday, had already been reaching out to their local police departments uh, to report this because they felt threatened. It was not just the ADL regional office and the Jewish Community Relations Council office. It was literally the private home address of a family that has a family philanthropy ad registered at that address. It was a day school that is, you know, let's just say it, not part of like the traditional like APAC ADL primary targets of these kinds of left-wing protests. It was a, a disability group that works with teens uh, being listed with an address, with board members' names on that. My administrative assistant's name was listed on it. So people had anxiety and fear. First step, ADL working with lo and lo local law enforcement, and I, I can't speak to the particulars of the conversation, but also clearly working with the regional FBI office. ADL in New England has built an amazing relationship with our US attorney, with the FBI. And like we always look to them and, and it's like always like, we're in touch with them, we're on it. Second step, Tuesday morning, there's this anxiety. How do we communicate to the community? How do we help the community navigate this? And, it's re and there was a joint message that went out from these three partners to the community saying, yes, we know about this. Yes, it's on our radar. Here's what's going on. Here's the communication ha being had with law enforcement. Now, I will tell you candidly, uh, and this is a discussion that we at JCRC and ADL were having in those first 24 hours, it was not entirely clear that it was wise to go wide in our response, to like blow this up into a public discourse because it looked like a marginal fringe group. We made a decision in conversation that there were reasons to go wide on this. Reason number one being that even before we had come back online Monday night, uh, the 
Israeli media was already publishing articles about it and covering it, and uh, the government of Israel had actually, the foreign ministry had already made a statement. So it was already out there in the public discourse. Reason number two being, there was genuine anxiety within our community. And reason number three, and this is gonna be the, the last thing I wanna bring into this opening, it was already being amplified and platformed by other left-wing actors in Boston who are part of, let's say, the mainstream left in Boston, and in particular, a group called Mass Peace Action. They were, while the mapping project was anonymous, and at that point had not even set up its own social media, it was first announced on a group called BDS Boston Social Media, and then this group called Mass Peace Action, which sits in something called the Progressive Alliance in Massachusetts, which does endorse candidates, which has given endorsements to many of our state legislators and members of our federal delegation. They were amplifying it on their social media. And that made it a more relevant mainstream element of the discourse in Boston. And it wasn't the first time, and this is the last part of that, that Mass Peace Action and others on the fringe left in Boston have been trying to create a social ecosystem in which Jews are a complication in civic space. There was an incident last fall when then candidate Michelle Wu, now our mayor in Boston, was running in her historic campaign. And these groups came out with a Twitter screed attacking her for taking, and I'm gonna quote, insidious Zionist end quote, money. And they named names of local Boston Jewish Democrats, hardcore Democrats who were involved in her campaign, donating campaign. They want to make it uncomfortable for her to even take support from Jewish Democrats. And this part of what the mapping project is doing as well. It's not just drawing a link from a Jewish disability group and saying they're responsible for Zionism or they are responsible for the quote, oppression of the Palestinians, it was also listing institutions in Boston like the Institute for Contemporary Arts, our Museum of Fine Arts, institutes at Harvard University, at other universities, and saying these institutions are targets of this need to dismantle a network of oppression because of their Jewish donors. So that when it listed those institutions, it didn't list all the ICA's board members, all the ICA's donors, the our art museum, it listed the Jewish donors. It listed the Jewish board members. They are trying to create a culture in which the CEO of the ICA or the director of a center at Harvard is forced to have a problem that na needs to be navigated just for engaging with local Jewish supporters. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm reliving this nightmare as you're talking about it. I want to turn to Justin for a, a moment because uh, part of what needed to happen when this launched was some deep analysis to understand exactly how it was representing typical anti-Semitic tropes of Jewish conspiracies, Jewish power. That is work that Justin was able to do and that in turn ended up being a very important piece in getting our elected officials to recognize this as an anti-Semitic website and, and initiative, not, not quote unquote merely an anti-Israel one. Justin, do you wanna take us through some of that? Okay, now I should be good. All right, sure, thank you, Peggy. Um, so, I mean, Jeremy touched on it a bit, but the mapping projects, it, it, it calls for dismantling uh, and physically disrupting, it says, uh, mainstream Jewish institutions that make up the backbone of the Jewish community. So they name several dozen uh, Jewish institutions, including the Jewish Community Relations Council, which Jeremy is the head of, ADL, of course. And, and uh, so if, if this were to come into being, there would essentially be no Jewish communal infrastructure. So that's one thing that's a huge issue with the mapping project, number one. Number two, if you look, they have something called like Boston Zionist NGO Network is one of their big things. So look, look at who's, who are they naming. It's all about how bad these Jewish Zionist organizations are and how they're using their money to exploit 
um, the, uh, uh, and stuff like that. So we have uh, so we have the Jewish community being blamed for exploitation, for uh, using their money nefariously, uh, and then we have, like Peggy mentioned, um, the naming of Zionism as a harm. Now, I mean, most of you here probably already understand why that's so problematic, but to just like spell it out, Zionism, we mean just support for the existence of a Jewish state, self-determination for the Jewish people in the uh, land of Israel. And the, of course, the vast majority of the Jewish community supports this. They call that a harm. So by definition, they're, they're, it's an attack on the mainstream and the vast majority of the Jewish community. So those are just some of the things that, that make up, uh, that really make the mapping project problematic. No, thank you for that. You know, in our conversations, both within the community and to elected officials, um, having, being able to, to kind of unpack that for them allowed them to lead their voices in opposition. Um, so, so thank you for that work at that time. One more question for you, Justin, before we turn back to Julie. Um, is the mapping project just, you know, an anomaly, or are we seeing this, you know, thinking of it as a tactic of isolation, of naming and shaming the Jewish community? Are we seeing it manifest in other places? It is not an anomaly. It's a pr just particularly egregious example of this, like you said, sort of naming and shaming of, of exclusion of anyone who's Zionist, anyone who supports the existence of Israel as a Jew, or just Israel's existence. It's part of what a pattern that we've seen for years now. So for example, we saw several years ago at San Francisco State University, we had some controversy um, the president came out and, and it was over like Zionism on campus. The president came out and said, uh, the president of the university came out and said, uh, we welcome Zionists on campus. They should be allowed on campus. And a professor on campus said, that is a declaration of war against anyone who stands for justice on campus. And of course she said, including Jews who are anti-Zionist, of course. So, so we, ha we had, things like that going on. And just in the past year, just a couple of examples, we had at SUNY New Paltz, we had uh, a sexual assault survivor support group, and one student posted, Israel isn't a colonial state on their personal social media. That got into such a controversy, the fact that she didn't think it was a colonial state, and the fact that she identified as Zionist, that eventually she was uh, expelled from this group. And there was another one, it was two from the same group who just because they identified as Zionists were expelled from this group. So uh, we've seen it on campus, I could go on, we saw the climate activist group Sunrise Movement, but I will, I will stop there. No, thank you. I think it's important for people to understand that we can't just say the mapping project is something that just happened in Boston. The, the themes of it, the intents of it, intentions of it can be replicated and, and have been. Julie, I wanna, um, I wanna ask you a question. Um, in many of my conversations with people in the aftermath of the mapping project, the, a common theme was, why are we always reacting? How can we be proactive? And um, as you look at ethical investing and the advocacy opportunity, it offers really the Jewish community with your leadership at Morningstar being one example. Can you take us through the opportunity we have in the corporate world through advocacy and the JLens uh, initiative? Yeah, sure. So the economic arena really is on par with the political arena for advocacy for, I was mentioning, the power that institutional investors and corporations have, and activists on a range of issues have recognized that. Um, so there is, just like in the political arena, in the economic arena, there is now a well-oiled machine and tactics and it's professionalized. There's thousands of, um, of, of professionals and firms and companies that are engaging in this space, engaging in advocacy. So really what we did at JLens was just to borrow the best practices that already existed, that really were well established, it, particularly by a lot of different faith communities um, before the Jewish community. Um, so, uh, Morningstar is, a, is an example. As, as Peggy noted, we have been, even in the corporate space, very reactive. We have a BDS pressure campaign, a company acquiesces to BDS, cuts their ties to Israel, and then the Jewish community responds. 
Um, and actually, I just want to take a step back for a moment because BDS is very well known on campus, uh, I think, for a lot of you. But it really also is a movement that has rippled through the economic space. So the history of BDS is 20 years ago. It was started at a UN conference in South Africa really to replicate what values-based investors did with South Africa, right, to put pressure on the country to, um, to change the apartheid policies of South Africa. But um, Israel is not South Africa. Um, but the, the goal is to, is to replicate what that campaign. Um, and so they came out of that conference 20 years ago and really started to move into values-based investing. And this anti-Israel viewpoint got baked in to the research, the policies, the investment strategies. Uh, and so that was something that we first discovered, uh, or that we discovered as um, Jalen's going in there from a Jewish perspective and caring about Israel and not wanting to support the BDS campaign. So again, as I mentioned, there have been a number of companies in Europe and increasingly now in the US that have been under significant pressure by BDS and have cut ties. And the community has been responsive. Uh, Morningstar is a great uh, case study of actually a uh, proactive approach to addressing what, what's going on in this space with BDS. So for, for the, anyone that works in finance, you are very uh, familiar with Morningstar. Uh, Morningstar is not the veggie burgers, or <laughs> uh, as some of you might have thought, uh, but it is a very powerful, multi-billion dollar investment research firm based in Chicago that uh, scores investment funds and, and provides research to investors. They, two years ago, bought a Dutch firm called Sustainalytics, which provides research, ESG research, which is the foundation of the field, right? The research and the scoring of companies is how investment decisions are made. They bought this firm called Sustainalytics, and Sustainalytics is a, a firm that we had known about for years, but they were owned by PGGM, which was a, a very large Dutch institution that had supported BDS and divested from Israeli companies in the past. So they were untouchable. They were a Dutch company owned by a BDS supporting firm, but they really, from our vantage point, were one of the key promoters uh, and enablers of BDS in the economic space because they took the, re the BDS research, they took the controversy, they baked it into their scoring of companies, their scoring of mutual funds. And not only that, uh, they also would, they, were, they worked for institutional investors, especially church funds in the US and European funds, and they were paid to do advocacy. So they would be paid by a European multi-billion dollar firm to go and pressure a company like Volvo, who sells trucks to the Israeli military. So they were paid BDS activists in the economic arena, and they represented hundreds of billions of dollars. So that is incredibly influential, and companies respond to that type of pressure and that type of advocacy. Um, so when they bought Sustainalytics, uh, Jalen's reached out, we sent a letter to the CEO, we started a dialogue, the dialogue didn't, didn't go very well. We ended up putting them on our do not invest list uh, almost two years ago. We filed a shareholder resolution. There have been many BDS shareholder resolutions. This was the first anti-BDS shareholder resolution, asking the company to do an independent review of their support and the, the profit that they make off of supporting BDS. Uh, again, the company kept denying, they did an internal review. Uh, finally, we started to get more uh, Jewish communal groups involved, and they, we actually got a connection to the chairman of the company, and we were able to really engage with him, and he agreed to hire a law firm. They did an independent, they call it an independent review, um, which started to expose some of the issues, but was not a full exposure. And then the Jewish community got involved. Jay Lenz and a number of organizations led by JFNA did a, um, a deeper dive into the problems. And, and we really came away with a number of um, agreements with Morningstar to really remove BDS from their products, to, from their advocacy, uh, from being baked into their services. And you know, one example is that they will no longer use the UN Human Rights Council as a source for their research. And this has shocked our field. This is shocking because the UN is on such a pedestal in the responsible investing field. And so for the UN Human Rights Council, which as many of us in this room I'm sure are aware, is very biased against Israel, but it's really not known outside the Jewish community. And so just starting those conversations and starting to push back on some of those inroads has been incredibly successful. And there are many more companies and firms that have this issue and lack transparency. And so um, it's a lot of work ahead for, for Jay Lenz and ABL. Now, thank you for sharing that and that important work and, and result. Um, the question that's going through my head is the 
it, both in the corporate sphere and really in city councils also, where we see a lot of uh, pro-BDS resolutions and, and requests and advocacy in that area. And, and looking at the mapping project, which had a lot of people's names and addresses, how much of this is having a, how much of a chilling effect is, is, is occurring as a result? Are people now less willing to be on Jewish communal boards? Are they less willing, are corporations less willing to set up shop in Israel? Are they pulling out um, just because there's gonna be noise associated with it? Or is there, is there enough of a, a dialogue and pushback? How, how do we assess that? I will let anyone who wants to jump into that question jump in. Turn my mic back on. Um, so yes, that's a really good question. And that is the goal of BDS, is to create, I mean, I've sat in, unfortunately, many BDS presentations. And what they will say is that our goal is to create controversy surrounding Israel so that Companies no longer want to do business there. Investors no longer want to invest there. We cripple the economy, and therefore, obviously, that has a devastating effect on, on the nation. Um, so that is the goal. They are already doing that. And so the question is, do we just let them create that controversy, or do we fight back and create a counter-controversy? Ultimately, yes, it, 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 it de there is an, an impact on, on Israel, but our belief is that we want to engage. We want companies to know that this is not the view of the entire ESG field. Uh, this is not the view of the, the Jewish community, and that there is actually a counter-controversy to cutting ties and to um, discriminating against Israel. Uh, but it is, it is very tricky because controversy is just a huge negative. Everyone wants to avoid controversy um, in the corporate social responsibility space. So it's, I don't have an easy answer. Um, if I can jump in. So I to totally agree. And I think this is a moment to also bring in some of the stuff because you've touched on at the sort of city council level uh, and say I actually think the reverse is true in a sense, and I'll tell you why. Um, we've had a situation not disconnected from the same actors in Boston who are closely associated with the mapping project of local BDS resolutions in city councils. Um, we're not the only community in the country where this is happening, but we've definitely had a situation, and we've gone through in the last two cycles of the Cambridge City Council. Uh, I live in the city of Cambridge, also known as the People's Republic of Cambridge. Uh, when this all sort of gained steam, and the first one I'm now, I know Peggy's like reliving, and I'm reliving now, uh, in 2019, uh, we had not been proactively organizing in advance of that as a Jewish community, and to come back to something you touched on, and there was an assumption, and we had learned that there was discussion, and that some of these groups were talking about, oh, the following Cambridge City Councilors have committed to offering a resolution endorsing specifically the boycott of Hewlett Packard, so to bring it into the corporate space, and it's gonna be like three weeks from now on Monday night, save the date on your calendar. And that's like on Facebook. And so ADL, JCRC, some of our other Jewish organizations in our region, together we started reaching out to members of the city council. And we're like, what's going on here? We have concerns, we're seeing this promise, and we learned a lot in a very short time about process. But what we also learned was that there was really only one side in that discourse at the moment that those public announcements dropped, namely that far left voices in Cambridge were going around to members of the city council and saying, you should do this, you should do this, you should boycott Hewlett Packard, Hewlett Packard's awful. By the way, there's no evidence that Hewlett Packard's awful, um, but that, I'll get to that in a moment. And that that's the right thing to do. And they took that as a, there's only one side to this discourse. And what they came to understand those few weeks is that there was actually a vocal Jewish community in, in Cambridge that wasn't previously seen that wasn't previously active in the political process, that hadn't made itself heard. That first round in 2019, it actually didn't end up getting put on the city council agenda, so it never got a hearing. Then lo and behold, in 2021, in May, I think we remember May 2021, there was a conflict with Gaza, brought the rockets, a lot of tension, a lot of anti-Semitism in America. It's gonna sound familiar now. On the Thursday night, before the long Shavuot weekend, two city councilors put forward a resolution 
to boycott Hewlett Packard because of its association with Israel. We go to the city council members, and by the way, we had learned in the 2019 process that there were allies on the city council. They, didn't, they weren't forced to publicly come out as allies because it never got to a hearing. Those allies on Shavuot in the city council meeting were like, we are going to table this for a week and said, it is not right that this goes forward without the Cam parts of the Cambridge Jewish community being involved in the hearing. The proponents of this were asked by ADL that organized a letter that we signed and others, asked them to postpone this debate so it wouldn't happen on Shavuot. The proponents of this BDS resolution were like, no, we're doing it on Shavuot, and by the way, we are perfectly fine with excluding the Jews of Cambridge from this discourse. So they had the hearing, but the, but the opponents, i.e. the anti-BDS members of the council, tabled it for a week. So we then had to have the hearing all over again the following week. Hundreds and hundreds of members of the Cambridge Jewish community showed up and testified. And hundreds and hundreds of members of the Cambridge Jewish community signed a letter. And then in the elections in 2021, members of the Cambridge Jewish community that had not previously been active in Cambridge politics, had not previously made themselves visible, and this comes to your question, actually came out, and I'm using that terminology deliberately, and organized a Cambridge Jewish Civic Association and did candidate forums. And one of the sponsors of the original anti-BDS resolution lost his re-election. And the number of members of the Cambridge City Council in 2022 who had pledged during their campaign to oppose municipal BDS actually increased. And that was because members of the Jewish community <laughs> So that's, that's my version of like, I actually think, to peg your question, the reverse is true, that the nature of the vociferous hostility, the explicit anti-Semitism of Cambridge City Council saying Jews in Cambridge don't have a right to participate in the public process, the explicit anti-Semitism in that the final resolution, uh, th which was offered by our friends and allies on the council, basically instructed the city of Cambridge to create a country neutral human rights prism for its investments. Country neutral human rights prism and immediately the proponents of BDS announced that a country neutral, they condemned them. They condemned that as a loss. They condemned that as backing away from BDS. They could not handle, they could not get themselves to a place of it's okay to say the same values we apply to Israel we would apply to China. That, and that exposed them for what they are, and I think it brought out a Jewish community in a more proud, active, and participatory way. Now, having witnessed all of that, I, I agree with you, but I also wanna raise, um, really for everybody in this room, what tactics and what role you have in playing that the next city council, the next corporation, and everything in between, um, that you're not scrambling a few weeks after such a resolution is, um, is put forth. Maintaining those relationships, speaking as one voice of the Jewish community well in advance of any of those resolutions is hugely important. We have heard um, in Cambridge and elsewhere that city councilors have met with other representatives of um, the Jewish community or purportedly the Jewish community who, who actually are pro-BDS. And um, you know, there's been a little bit of uh, I guess maybe neglect of those relationships. And I think um, if, if I leave you with any message today, that it's really important to shore up those relationships, um, have them ready because there's gonna be a challenge at some point and um, starting those relationships after a resolution has been introduced is, is really, really late. So that, that is one point. Um, and this, the second one, um, I think, uh, is, uh, you know, it's, it's related. You don't only shore this up early, but um, you build your allies um, in the community. And, and this is um, sort of the point that I opened with. When we speak and, and respond to issues like this in Boston, um, you know, we like to think we're special in Boston, but we speak as, as a unified community. We are special in Boston. <laughs> and, um, 
no one just hears the voice of ADL, they hear a unified voice. And that has spoken volumes, both um, in terms of its effectiveness with city councils, with elected officials, you know, at the federal level, at the state level. And um, I, don't, I wanna make sure that everybody leaves this session knowing that we're stronger together. So um, we don't have that much time left. And at this point, what I wanna do is turn to each of our panelists and ask, um, ask each of you to, to talk about a few effective strategies to deploy to, to counter both that tactic of isolation of the Jewish community we talked about earlier and to talk um, and, and tactics where we can proactively advocate. Maybe we'll start with you, Julie. Yeah, sure. So I, uh, Jalen's is, um, philosophy is very much an ADL and a JCRC philosophy that we have so many friends, so many allies, we have this incredibly broad Jewish value set that we have so many shared values as a result. Um, and so they're really, uh, um, I think to, to your point, Peggy, about relationship building uh, and being allies on other issues allows us to then ask for help when we have a concern and we have an issue. So that's certainly what we've seen in our field. Um, the, other, the other thing that I would say though is that uh, for, for all of you, to, if you find something that feels like anti-Semitic or feels anti-Israel, to speak up, to reach out to some of your local Jewish organizations. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we were talking as we were prepping for this that, that the workplace, we do a lot of work with corporations, but also looking at the workplace and workplace education, workplace anti-Semitism, of course, ADL does a lot of work in that area as well in training. But the workplace is gonna become the new campus. We've raised generations of activists who want to make change and, and use the levers of power, uh, which is a fantastic thing. Uh, but as a result, we have a, a, a number of folks who are young and who are graduating from college who are now in the workplace and starting to mobilize on a range of issues, which again, I, I think is terrific, thinking about sustainability at corporations, thinking about social justice issues. But as we know that BDS can um, mobilize as well in those spaces and being able to speak out and speak up and find your allies uh, where you can find them, I think is really a good, um, good strategy. Um, I would just continue to build on the being proactive and building relationships in advance. The wins in Cambridge in 2021 came because of relationships built with Cambridge City Councilors in 2019. In the context of the mapping project and building on something Justin talked about, the first denunciations, the wide denunciation from progressives, progressives in politics, progressives in civic space, progressives on the national scene, came because of conversations in the first 48 to 72 hours that happened by ADL staff, it happened by JCRC leaders, going to them because we were already in relationship with them. They were people who were like, oh, something's going on in the Jewish community, who do I need to, who do I trust and talk to in the Jewish community to understand what's going on? Those relationships are already established in advance and forged. And then the final part is like, educate yourself about how to talk about anti-Semitism in ways that can be understand by these audiences. And I'll connect it to the second one. It's fine that we had those relationships in those first 48 and 72 hours with folks after the mapping project, but it was also about being able to help them understand how the mapping project, and I'm gonna be blunt, is the same underlying conspiracy theory as the man who murdered 11 Jews in Pittsburgh. And that conspiracy, what I mean by that is, there are people in this country on the far right, on the far left, who look around and say, I and mine are being oppressed. I and mine are losing power. I and mine are in trouble. Who's to blame? The Jews. Now one is violent murder and the other is putting up a website, but the underlying idea that whenever I and mine are in trouble, it's the Jews who are to blame is the same conspiracy theory. Educating ourselves to be able to have that conversation so that when we went to those progressive leaders after the mapping project and say, it's not the same, but it is, allowed them to come to the conclusion to be publicly the leaders denouncing it. So build the relationships, do the pre proactive work, and get yourself educated to talk thoughtfully. And I'll just add a couple more thoughts quickly. Um, you also, like, like it was said before, you have a voice, right, to your local paper 
right? Uh, you know, right? You know, maybe you can get published in a response to an anti-Israel article, or maybe you can write an article that gets published about you know your connection to Israel or Zionism or something else that's important in the Jewish community. Um, uh, another one, if you are on campus and you and you have an anti something anti-Israel happens or anti-Semitic, contact your your DEI officer or or some or, you know some uh, administration official. You know, people are there to help. And also ADL, we're here to work for you. So you can actually go on our website if you ex if you experience an anti-Semitic incident and report it. And we're we're here to help you through that. And the last thing I'll say is solidarity. It's just like we want people to be here for us. We need to be there for others. So other communities that are going through bigotry and similar things, it's important that we show up in those spaces as well. Thank you, Justin. I have a lot of questions here. I'm gonna try to go through um, as many of them as possible, either with the panelists or some I'll, I'll answer myself. So there's a question about, can, have we been able to follow the money with the mapping project? They have taken incredibly great pains to be as um, anonymous as possible. It is an anonymous project. You know, the FBI has been involved. They have not been able to do much more than confirm to us that they're they're following. But we haven't been able to find out the exact people behind it. Um, and and without being able to follow that money, we we just haven't been able to identify who they are yet. That said, there are some tactics and some, some initiatives we have led that relates to deplatforming the mapping project. When it was first announced, it was on an internet service provider in the US. Um, we were able to, to demonstrate that that was a violation of that service provider's um, terms and services. They were deplatformed, moved to, I believe it was Bulgaria, went through the same process there, they were deplatformed. Now they're in Iceland, with an internet service provider called 1984, which you can just kind of imagine their corporate philosophy. So um, we, are, we are not done yet, but we are continuing to advocate for the deplatforming. Let me just keep going to uh, a question for Julie, but any panel member can answer. Again, where is the money coming from that supports not just um, the mapping project, but all of the corporate ESG that is decidedly anti-Israel. Yeah, so the, 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 the leading money and, the, and as a result, the leadership, the value set um, in the values-based investing field really originates with um, a number of church communities and European institutions. Uh, so it's their value set. Uh, we have the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Quakers, I would say, at the top. Um, who, who really set the stage, but they were the early money in. Um, unfortunately, there is some anti-Semitism and some uh, BDS activity in those communities that are really strong and very vocal. Um, and so those policies get passed and they get implemented into the investment endowments and they have large church funds. So, and then on the European side, we have sovereign funds from a variety of countries who uh, I guess are not very, um, not as, as big of fans of Israel as we would like. And so, but again, they, they paid for the research, they paid for the, the custom screens, they, I mean, so that is what we're unpacking a little bit is as this field grows, that's, that's one value set, it's not the only value set, and it should be transparent so investors know what they're actually investing in and there's not transparency right now. Um, so we have another question, which is where is the mapping project now? It's still a live website. We do not generally recommend that people tune into it because we don't really want to drive traffic there. But I do want to um, illustrate one way the mapping project has been used recently. Some may recall that about a month ago, the uh, st student newspaper at Wellesley College, the editorial board, endorsed both BDS and the mapping project. So it's being used as a tool um, and, and cited as, as giving some sort of credibility to that point of view. What happened in response was actually quite interesting and again, another data point for activism and advocacy in response. The president of Wellesley College, while completely recognizing the right of student editorial boards to make whatever pronouncement they want, Wellesley is not unlike you know, the Harvard Crimson, which also endorsed BDS, she did call them out 
on their endorsement of the mapping project by saying you are endorsing something that is inherently anti-Semitic and, and is a, a call to violence, and, and she called them out on that. It was a very courageous stand by President Johnson, um, and it was one that subjected her to a protest of many, many students in front of her home on the campus. But she called out something that, that actually we hope more people will call out when the mapping project is used to support BDS. Um, and I just wanted to, to call that out for, for all of you because when you see it, you can ask and, and raise your voice to call that out. Can I jump in for one second? And just say, when I joked at the beginning, not joked, that coming to a theater near you, to understand that it really is. We're not just talking about some universities in like New England. When the mapping project came up, out, there was, we saw endorsement from particularly Students for Justice in Palestine around the country and national Students for Justice in Palestine. And we saw social media saying, why don't we have this in our community? We should do this here too. So like that advice is not just for those of you in New England, it's for all of us. So I'm going to turn to another question. This is really an interesting one. Um, this, this person writes, I find that the mapping project is a shocking violation of privacy and it's bullying. That being said, to what extent might the mapping project reflect a generational divide? So I, I want to put out there that the information about names of people and addresses were procured really through publicly available information on the, on the internet. There's a lot of stuff out there about people. And um, in, a, in a lot of senses, it's really good to say X, Y, and Z or A, B, and C people are on the board of JCRC or ADL. It's a way of people showing their, their pride in, in their affiliations. At the same time, um, what the mapping project did with that information is what's so troubling. They took those names and they built a, a narrative around it that was very damaging, very harmful, and in, as Justin was talking about, was really a, a call for disruption, um, which was very threatening and intimidating to the community. So I wanted to, to respond to that question to say that the actual information wasn't um, a violation of privacy because it was available, but the way it was used was, and that's where we all should be raising our voices. So I am getting the signal that we are out of time, so I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing this and thank all of you for contributing.